recording uh, now such that we uh, we uh, get this all recorded and it will be sent out to uh, all the participate uh, participants after the uh, the uh, webinar. Um, the webinar will also be uh, uh, accessible on uh, Wix Academy, uh, which is our online uh, learning platform where we have uh, essentially uh, a uh, subscription model where you get uh, access to live virtual uh, courses every single year, live topical uh, webinars, and also uh, on-demand pre-made courses uh, the, uh, uh, that uh, we'll go through a couple of examples of that in a, in a second. And of course, how-to videos and tutorials when that's uh, relevant, for instance, how to generate uh, black hole tables, et, uh, et cetera. Uh, some of the example courses are typically in the realm of what the, we at Whitson specialize uh, at, typically within PVT and face behavior and uh, gas EOR, gas concept reservoirs, and in general uh, well performance. And very important for us to emphasize is that we try to cater for all, all uh, levels, uh, all the way from beginner to, uh, to expert. Uh, the two last courses on Whitson Academy uh, is uh, the first one uh, is a course by uh, my colleague, uh, Bilal Yunus which uh, goes through how you can actually call it to check a, a PVT laboratory report. Uh, and that's a very nice course uh, to uh, have access to on demand because there's a lot of questions that you typically just ask yourself when you, once you get the new PVT laboratory uh, report. And then you can also just go into that course and look at specific uh, experiments that you've actually conducted in, in uh, your particular PVT uh, experiment. Uh, then also uh, uh, Milan Stanko has uh, uh, just released a new uh, introduction course on uh, production engineering, goes through everything from, uh, from A to Z, uh, and it's a very, very nice uh, uh, and comprehensive beginners uh, to intermediate uh, course that goes through a lot of the key topics uh, related to production engineering. So production performance, gathering systems, IPR curves, uh, pipe flow, and artificial work. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, all the information about our courses, et cetera, can be found on witson.com slash uh, training. Uh, that's also where you will find uh, information about uh, our next webinars. Uh, so our next webinar is already coming up in, uh, uh, in November. Uh, it is uh, a webinar with, uh, with Kyle uh, Hauswhite from uh, Devon. Uh, and he's going to discuss modern ways to uh, perform factor diagnostics in tight and conventional or so-called uh, shale uh, reservoirs. So that's uh, uh, already possible to, to sign up for that webinar as uh, well. Um, so now introducing the uh, speaker, uh, we have with us today uh, uh, John Rafalovsky, which is an as associate consultant here at uh, Whitson. Uh, he, uh, he is a uh, true industry expert within uh, reservoir fluids and, and flow assurance and have a long, long track record in the industry from, uh, from Schlumberger and uh, also Shell. So he's seen both sides of the table, both from a service perspective and uh, an operator. And his uh, education comes from, from uh, both uh, the University of Houston, where he did his PhD in chemical engineering. And before that, he did his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from uh, Purdue. So on that note, uh, I just uh, open the floor for you, uh, uh, John, and uh, what I'll do now is just to stop sharing and then make you a presenter. And after that, I'll just uh, uh, mute myself. Okay, uh, let's see. So is everything showing up okay? The, uh, let's see here. I can see it now. Let's try one more time. Okay, let me do that again. There it goes. There we go. Perfect. Just take that. All, right. All right, thank you for uh, letting me uh, present this webinar today. Um, we talked a little bit about wax and asphalt teams, but we only have uh, about 45 minutes to an hour. So we can't go too deep into it. So for those of you who are Flow assurance experts who have worked uh, a long time in the industry, this may be a little bit basic for you, but uh, hopefully for some of the other people, uh, uh, you'll find something in here that you haven't seen before. Uh, this pr presentation will have a little bit of a historical perspective around it too as well, uh, and it may give you some insight as to how some of the more standard measurements now are developed and used. So to start off, uh, this is a, a slide that many of you have probably already seen, just the solids and production systems. 
when they come out in pressure and temperature during the uh, production process. Uh, and here we can see both the wax and asphaltine phase boundary for kind of a, a common Gulf of Mexico fluid. And what we see is when asphaltine pr uh, problems are present, that you will hit that phase boundary at higher pressure and temperatures. And at much lower temperatures and pressures, you tend to cross the uh, wax phase boundary. So asphaltine problems generally occur in the formation in the production tubing, while wax often occurs in the flow lines. However, there are some situations where you have high wax uh, systems and it's relatively cold reservoir temperature where you can get wax in the well. So one more thing on terminology, and again, this is something I think is generally understood now, but it's probably worth mentioning. Precipitation is the formation of a solid phase out of a liquid phase. So this is a thermodynamic process. It's a function of pressure, temperature, and composition. Deposition is a formation and growth of a solid layer on the surface. So this is not only a function of the thermodynamic conditions, it's also a function of the transport conditions. So you have the geometry of the system, the shear at the surface, uh, surface and particle interactions, and pressure, temperature, and composition. I will mention a little bit about impairment related to asphaltines. And impairment is really for plugging in the reservoir. So you either form solid layers on, on uh, poor surfaces or you bridge with particles across poor throats. Uh, this again is a function of geometry velocity, surface particle interactions, and the thermodynamic conditions. Uh, precipitation is necessary, but not a sufficient condition for deposition and impairment. So we actually have to have the solid coming out of solution for it to cause a problem, uh, either through deposition or impairment. All right, waxes, what are they? Uh, typically in a normal crude, we'll see that normal paraffins actually dominate the wax deposit. Uh, the normal paraffins have the highest uh, heat effusion and also the highest melting temperature in any given boiling point or molecular weight fraction. The normal paraffins form a crystalline solid. This solid tends to be more mechanically competent. Uh, and also it impacts some of our measurement techniques and I'll discuss that a little bit later. If I have isoparaffins and cycloparaffins, and they usually are contributors in these deposits, um, they will form what's called a microcrystalline wax. And what that is, is these long uh, aliphatic side chains will lay down next to each other and you'll have small, very small regions of uh, crystals that look like the normal paraffin crystals, but all these side chains will mess that up. So you will not have like a macroscopically nice crystalline phase. These waxes tend to be uh, <clears throat> form at lower temperatures. They also uh, they also aren't as me mechanically uh, uh, competent as the crystalline uh, deposits. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later because it impacts how we do our measurements. What causes wax to precipitate? Uh, primarily, a change in temperature in the systems we're interested in. We can see from the solubility trace on the bottom uh, that wax is a function, wax solubility is a function of pressure. In the single phase region, as we go to high pressures, the wax appearance temperature does increase. Uh, it will decrease as pressure is reduced down to the saturation pressure, at which point in time gas is released from solution and the, uh, the measured wax will start to go up. So this is a change in composition that's pressure induced. Um, what we measure in the lab is usually the dead oil value. So that is usually the maximum value we see in the system, except for a very highly undersaturated pressure, uh, pressurized systems. Sometimes the watt at, uh, the reservoir pressure will be even higher than it, it is at the, uh, at, at the dead oil conditions, but that's really irrelevant because at those high pressures, we're usually way above the wax uh, appearance temperature anyway. So it's not really a function in, uh, you know, looking at wax problems in the system. So primarily it's the change in temperature that is uh, what we're interested in as far as wax issues. So what kind of problems does that cause us? Well, uh, of course, wax deposits form on surfaces and uh, you will get those in well bores occasionally, mostly flow lines and pipelines. And we can get excessive pressure drops or sometimes even nearly complete uh, blockage. There's also a viscosity or rheology issue as we fall down below the wax appearance temperature and start 
precipitating a lot of wax. We can get into a region where we have large shear dependent viscosities. Uh, precipitated wax can also uh, stabilize emulsions. And in either case, we can get excessive pressure drops because of the high apparent or high viscosity of the waxy fluid. There's also the potential for gelling uh, in no-flow conditions when we're below the pore point. And if the fluid gels, and we may have high restart pressures uh, for shutting flow lines and pipelines. So, what do we do to control and remediate these? Uh, it's a pretty standard toolkit. Uh, thermal management is probably one of the biggest things. We retain heat through insulation. Uh, we can also add heat uh, through electrical, you know, direct electrical heating. For chemical, uh, there are pore point depressants to take care of the gelling and rheology problems. Also, there are chemicals inhibitors and crystal modifiers, which will reduce the rate of wax deposition and sometimes change the morphology of the deposited wax. If I have a wax problem and I want to, to remove it, uh, I can use thermal methods, hot oil, exothermic reactions, active electrical heating. Uh, chemicals and solvents, uh, which are more effective if they're uh, warm or heated up. And you can also do mechanical pigging of flow lines and cutting of wells. So, how do we determine whether we have a wax problem? Usually, we take samples and we bring them into lab. And there are a variety of different laboratory analyses we can do. We can do composition characterization. Uh, and that's usually always done. We can actually measure the thermodynamic boundaries, the phase boundaries. For solid liquid equilibrium, solid vapor equilibrium, we can look at wax cuts or solubility of wax in the fluid as a function of pressure and temperature. Typically, we don't do much of this. The only phase boundary we measure is the dead oil wax appearance temperature, uh, mostly because the models that we've developed, we're, we're fairly happy with them as far as engineering calculations are concerned. Uh, for rheology, we can measure the viscosity, in particular shear dependent viscosity when the fluid is uh, below the wax appearance temperature. Uh, we can also measure either in a rheometer or in a, a flow line test uh, the gel strength or pore point. Um, deposition tendency and rate, I'll talk a little bit about that. That's not typically measured anymore, again, because the models and the field experience we have seem to be. Um, uh, good enough for engineering calculations, but it is something that can be measured and has been measured in the past. So, for composition, we'll always have the C30 plus oil composition, mostly for the VLE. The other types of measurements we may want to make are quantitative high temperature GC, HTGC analysis for normal paraffin content. That was a standard when I worked at Shell, we would always make that measurement. Now, I'll discuss why in a, in a little bit. Other measurements that are made are UOP wax content, which I've found not that uh, useful for modeling. Uh, some models require PIN, paraffin, isoparaffin, naphthen, or uh, PNA, uh, where the A is aromatic. Some uh, characterization methods can act, use Sarah data as well. So you may make some of these additional measurements depending upon the modeling approach that you're using. So, what do wax deposits look like? Uh, you can see the parent oil at the top, the wax deposits on the bottom. Uh, usually, they're dominated by carbon chains greater than C30, but this really depends on the temperature at which they're uh, depositing. If the temperature is relatively high, I've seen deposits that might have C40, C50 as uh, the peak in the deposit. Uh, non alkanes may be part, and they typically are part of the deposits. But the NL canes control the phase boundary when present, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, the oil, uh, there is oil trapped in wax deposits. I mean, the function is the amount of how the deposit was actually generated. So it can be a function of shear and the age of the deposit. Higher shears and older deposits tend to have less oil content and tend to be harder. And you can see from the uh, pictures here, this is the parent oil. Uh, you really don't see much of the normal paraffins in here because it's, uh, they're actually quite small in concentration of normal oil. But on the deposit, these normal paraffins in this region are come out and deposit, and that is what forms the deposit on the, uh, on the surface of the pipe. You can also see here that there's a, a substantial amount of oil in the deposit. Uh, 
and the amount of oil contained in the deposit will impact the mechanical properties of the deposit. High oil deposits, and some of the high oil deposits may have over 90% oil or very gel-like. Uh, low oil de uh, deposits will be very hard. But even in the hard deposits, there's a, a still a substantial amount of occluded oil. All right, so this is one of the important things about the wax phase boundary, and this is what we use all the time in our modeling, and it's something that people should be aware of. The cloud point and wax appearance temperature, they have been used interchangeably to refer to the wax phase boundary. Now, the thermodynamic WAP uh, is defined as the highest temperature, which is solid phase wax will exist at a given pressure. This is really very difficult to measure in practice because when the wax starts coming out in a natural system like a crude oil, a very small amount comes out of solution, not very much at all. It's very difficult to see that with the methods we use to measure wax appearance temperature. The actual thing that we measure, the measured WAP, is a temperature where we see a detectable amount of solid phase forming upon cooling in the time frame of the measurement. So the kinetics and the procedure are important. Uh, so, you know, how, what rate do we cool this at? That can impact the uh, value of your wax appearance temperature. And the detection limit of the method you're using to measure this is also important. So I'm not gonna see the first crystal of wax coming out. I have to have enough come out that my detection method will actually see a signature of the wax. And, and that can be an issue as well too. All right, how historically have uh, rats been measured? There's a lot of different things that have been tried. Uh, where the cloud point gets its name from is these ASTM visual methods where they look for cloudiness in fluids. Those are really only good for transparent fluids, so not really something we use uh, in the oil and gas industry. The two most popular methods are DSD, differential scanning calorimetry, this looks at the heat signature of uh, the actual crystallization. There's a heat of uh, fusion associated with that. And so with DSC, we're looking for a, a signature that shows that uh, wax is actually crystallizing. Remember that uh, the uh, crystalline waxes, the normal paraffins, have a high heat of fusion, so they're gonna be easier to see on a DSC. The microcrystalline waxes have a much lower heat of fusion, and so it may make it a little bit more difficult to pick up something like that on a DSC. Cross-polar microscopy. Uh, here we have, uh, we have uh, two filters and it's a visual technique. We have two filters that cross-polarize the light. And what happens is if the light passes through the crystalline wax, it's rotated so that the other filter on the back side uh, does not filter out the light. So you'll see, because of the rotation of the light, you'll see a white spot in CPM where there's crystalline wax. And again, we come back to the, if it's not crystalline, you won't see it. So if you have a microcrystalline wax coming out, uh, it's gonna be very difficult on a CPM to actually see it when it comes out. <clears throat> so both the uh, DSE and CPM are somewhat uh, geared towards the crystalline wax, uh, but luckily, the, the normal paraffins are usually what uh, control the, uh, the wax appearance temperature. So it's not a huge issue uh, that these are not looking at the microcrystalline waxes. You can also use light scattering, viscometry, cold finger, filter plugging. These are, will actually uh, see any wax that's out. We have to use the cold finger oftentimes at shell. Uh, particularly when you know, you're looking at microcrystalline wax that we didn't think we could see with the CPM. And you will see a difference in CPM and cold finger measurements when uh, you have that type of wax. Uh, acoustic, uh, we, we tried that. Uh, we haven't had a lot of, at least in my uh, experience, we haven't had a lot of luck with that. Although that has a lot to do with the design of the cell. And so there may be a potential for uh, using that as well. And I'm sure I've missed some of the other methods. So, uh, uh, you know, I always put others at the end here. The reason why we go with DSC and CPM is out of all of these, with maybe the exception of a well done cold finger, they're the most sensitive. So, their limited detection is better than, say, viscometry, uh, for instance. 
So thinking a little bit about these measurements, um, I just wanted to, again to emphasize with these solubility curves why it's difficult to measure the thermodynamic phase boundary. We see here two uh, normal paraffin distributions. So this is HTDC data. Uh, the lower one is a lower wax content, of course, uh, oil. The other one is a, a waxier oil. And you see a solubility isotherm here drawn. This is really a cartoon. I didn't use uh, a package to calculate this particular line. But they, these lines are log linear uh, in this plot, these solubility lines. You can see if the solubility line <clears throat> where it uh, intersects the upper curve, there's a lot of wax out here. So you would see this in a DSC or in a, uh, a CPM. So there'd be a lot of material out. It would be easy to detect. Now, if I want to find the cloud point of this uh, or wax appearance temperature of this fluid, you can see with this solubility curve, I'm actually below the wax appearance temperature. There is solids out here, but these are very high molecular weight uh, normal paraffins and a very small amount of them. So the chances that I'm going to form a crystal with this uh, amount of material large enough to see, or the chance that I'm going to get a signature on a DSC large enough to see with a small amount of material is pretty slim. So I will not get the thermodynamic phase boundary, but I will get something inside of that phase boundary. And that's true with all these measurements. Uh, even a well done measurement is going to give you something that's a little bit lower than the actual thermodynamic uh, phase boundary. I didn't have a DSC traces and I'm not really that good at interpreting them. So I'll just show you a CPM measurement and you can get a feel for uh, why it's difficult to see the actual onset. You can see here at high temperatures, there is no little white dots, so there's no wax there. As you come down, you get these small white dots and you can see them here. These are actually pretty good pictures and they're pretty apparent that you're down below the wax appearance temperature. But when these things first start coming out, they're really small and very difficult to see. And I can remember uh, when I worked in the lab up in Edmonton, we uh, might have two or three people come look at this, look at these pictures and then see what they could see because everybody sees something a little bit different when it's so small of a signature. Now you get down well below the wax appearance temperature and you see a lot of it. And so there's, there's no, uh, you know, no issue and knowing whether wax is out or not. So you see the interpretation of this can be a little bit difficult. There is some potential for image processing and other techniques to standardize this a little bit better. But the work we did early on on that we, uh, was not so successful, but the methods today are, are so much more advanced that that may be uh, an opportunity for people. Uh, finally, uh, this is just a neat picture that I, I show a lot. Uh, it's one of the few cases where we were able to visually observe uh, wax and asphaltine uh, coming out in the live system together. And you can see the asphaltines come out first, and then the wax comes out, these white areas are wax. So uh, oftentimes, uh, waxing and asphaltine can be a problem together. So if we're looking at deposition measurements, a lot of things have been tried. Capillary tube plugging was an early way of uh, actually developing uh, deposition models. Uh, I've worked a lot with the shear cell and cold finger, and there's a lot of large scale flow loops, which of course is the uh, most representative way of looking at this. And a lot of work has been done in this area. Uh, again, the issues, deposition is a function of hydrodynamics, geometry, pressure, temperature, and composition. That's why the large scale flow loops are most representative. Uh, and wax deposition runs are typically made on dead oil, but that's okay. Uh, the only thing you'll see with live oil is a depression of deposition rates and um, uh, also wax appearance temperatures. So this is just what I have to show you some deposition data. This is in the shear cell. And what we see in the shear cell is the dead oil deposition rate is relatively high as compared to the live oil. This is a live oil sample. Um, and that would be expected because you, by adding the gas into the system, you're depressing the wax appearance temperature, which also depresses the rate, the deposition rate at the surface. Uh, and you can look at inhibitor testing as well too. And you can see here uh, pictures of various inhibitors that were used 
um, and the amount of wax that was deposited. And so you can see that the inhibitors do actually reduce the wax deposit, but don't eliminate it, which is, is pretty consistent with uh, what you see in practice. So um, for rheometry, there, uh, you can use a high pressure rheometer to measure live oil, uh, shear dependent rheometry. And you can see here as we reduce temperature at high temperatures, it's very Newtonian, has a low viscosity, then you drop well below the uh, wax appearance temperature at this 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And I get a much higher viscosity and a, a large shear dependency. So we're, as we go down to zero shear, this thing is, is trying to gel up. Um, looking at uh, gel strength, uh, a lot of times we can also use a rheometer to do this, but uh, uh, in the past, both the Shell and DBR, we used uh, something called a model pipeline test where you would fill a coil with oil and then you would gel it using a temperature profile uh, or a temperature history that you thought was representative of the field. And then you just measure the uh, pressure required to restart uh, or move that gel. And you can see here uh, that uh, for dead oil, the gel strength in this particular oil was re relatively high. With just a couple hundred pounds of gas pressure, the gel strength actually falls down quite substantially. Uh, but that really occurs at low pressure. If I go all the way to 5,000 pounds of gas pressure on the system, I don't see a lot of, of uh, difference from the 250 pounds. So you would expect in a live oil system that your actual gel strength and your pore points are going to be somewhat reduced over those measured on uh, dead oil. But a lot of people use the dead oil results just to be conservative. But you do have a lot of leeway there. All right, one final thing to note on wax uh, that is very important is biodegradation. And particularly if you have biodegradation in the reservoir and you may have variable biodegradation in a reservoir where a lot of it's occurring at the gas, uh, at the oil water interface. And as you get away from that, you may uh, see less. It's important to know that that will impact your wax properties quite substantially. Uh, so this is a nice plot. It was uh, came originally from Shell, uh, and it shows uh, some oils and various degrees of biodegradation. So the kind of the base oil uh, with no biodegradation might have uh, wax profile, uh, normal paraffin profile that looks like this, and they have appreciable uh, uh, cloud point numbers. These aren't high pore point oils, so the pore points are, are still pretty low. If I have partial biodegradation where I remove a lot of the lower uh, molecular weight normal paraffins, it actually impacts the pore point or the gel strength first. So you see in this area where I have uh, intermediate biodegradation, my pore point is really low. But my cloud point, yes, it's come down some, but it's not come down as much as a pore point. So I have 22, 26 degrees here as compared to 30 and 35 degrees. Now, when I get to the severely biodegradated systems, both the cloud point and the pore point drop substantially. So these were uh, made with cold finger. So uh, they, they actually are showing the uh, real wax deposit uh, for the cloud point measurement, uh, because we know what will happen is if you get into the severely biodegraded systems where all the normal paraffins are gone, it's gonna be hard to see anything on DSC or uh, CPM. So uh, if I have a lot of biodegradation, I'm usually gonna be in an area where wax is not really an issue, although the biodegradation does negatively impact uh, oil quality. All right, so quickly moving to asphaltines. Um, what are they? It's, they're defined as, as uh, insoluble in either normal C5 or, or C7, so pentane or heptane, uh, and soluble in uh, toluene or dichloromethane. It, it, you know, uh, the, the definition varies, but what is true is it is, these are the, the most polar portion of the oil. They're comprised of aromatic and polycyclic uh, clusters. They may have some uh, hetero groups in them, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen. Uh, the metals, uh, nickel, vanadium, and iron are contained within porphyrins within these, uh, these structures. 
Now, this is just a hypothetical structure and it actually probably has a little higher uh, condensed aromatic area than some descriptions of asphaltines. But asphaltines are not as easily definable as wax. These are a large class of molecules that are aromatic and polar. Whereas wax is, you know, mostly normal paraffins, uh, some substituted normal paraffins uh, as well, but it's easier compositionally to define a wax as, a, uh, as opposed to a, an asphaltine. Okay, what causes asphaltines to come out of solution? Uh, there are really two main issues that we look at. Uh, pressure depletion above PSAT, and I'll discuss that in the next slide. As I decrease pressure, I can uh, come and hit this upper asphaltine locus, uh, and I will continue to, to uh, generate asphaltine, to precipitate asphaltine, until I hit the saturation curve. And after that, the actual solubility of the asphaltine in the liquid phase increases, so I redissolve it as, as I go down to lower pressures. Um, change in oil composition is specifically important in gas injection processes. You can see this phase diagram over here, uh, which is similar to the sorts of phase diagrams we see with CO2 injection. You can see as I continue to add CO2 uh, at some point uh, here above the bubble point, I will have a, a region where I have liquid, uh, the liquid phase, the oil phase, and asphaltines precipitated. Uh, and again, as I go down below the bubble point, I'm releasing gas from the system. So I'm actually uh, increasing the solubility of the asphaltine and eventually it will go back in maybe. Um, so I have an area here of liquid vapor and asphaltine and a liquid vapor area over here. So if that is one thing you have to be concerned about with gas injection processes for asphaltic oils. Um, change in temperature, you look at this asphaltine locus and it, does it is a function of temperature as it must be however when we look at our production path usually we're coming down from high pressure into low into lower temperatures and lower pressure so by the time we get to these really low temperatures we're already down below the bubble point so it's really the compositional changes that are dominating not so much the temperature but one thing to note with the temperature is a lot of times we take these samples uh, and we're really careful. We do single phase down hole. We put them in a bottle. We bring them up. We make sure it's overpressurized, so maybe even above uh, the reservoir pressure. But then we store them uh, for a long period of time at ambient temperature. There is the possibility that the change in temperature, going from reservoir temperature down to ambient in the storage, will cause asphaltines to precipitate in the stored sample. So you really need to be careful if you store a sample for a long period of time that you check and make sure that you haven't precipitated asphaltines that you have not been able to get back into solution during restoration. Uh, and that's a problem that we, uh, that we have seen with the, doing these analyses. All right, so asphaltines have poor uh, solubility in saturates like hydrocarbon gases and some non-hydrocarbon gases like nitrogen and CO2. They have good solubility in aromatics, uh, resins, and polar solvents. And a lot of times people use a solubility parameter approach in, in order to uh, model this type of behavior. And you can see over here, there's just a couple pictures where we added resins into an oil and we saw as expected that the, uh, uh, that the solubility for asphaltines increased. And we can see here that uh, really the lighter molecular weight gases, C2 and uh, C1, C3, have a much more destabilizing effect on this than something like a hexane or heptane. All right, I put this up because a lot of people have a hard time saying, you know, compositionally, nothing is changing when I depressurize. The composition remains the same. Why does the asphaltine solubility change? Uh, and this is just a little cartoon that makes it, it, at least for me, easier to understand. These like gas components, as I decrease pressure, their partial molar volume increases quite substantially. On the liquid components, the C7 plus components, as I reduce pressure, uh, their partial molar volume uh, doesn't increase that much. It does increase a little bit, but not a lot. So when I get down to the lower pressures on a volume basis, the asphaltine sees around it much more saturated than, than the aromatic liquid uh, so as a, as a uh, consequence, 
it can be destabilized. And, and of course, if you run this through the thermodynamic packages, you can just look at the chemical potential changes and you can see this happening. But from a physical standpoint, this was a little easier for me to understand, particularly when I was working on this early in my career. So asphalting related problems, composition changes uh, can cause, be caused by instability due to commingling and compatible fluids, carryover and blending. Uh, we've seen gas lift mandrels foul because the injection gas is, is uh, not uh, compatible with the, uh, uh, you know, with the produced fluid. And also injection gas for uh, EOR uh, when it breaks through, we see a lot of wellbore deposition and sometimes fouling of pumps. Uh, pressure changes, um, we can see reservoir impairment in some systems, which will lower PI. Uh, deposits and wellbores, mostly flow lines occasionally can cause plugging. Uh, precipitated solids, uh, oftentimes uh, they accumulate in low energy regions, so they may accumulate around a valve or on the back side of a choke plate where you have uh, stagnation points. So they can just gum things up a lot. Uh, and also asphalt teams uh, are a key actor in emulsion stabilization. So uh, you can oftentimes in asphaltic fluids have very difficult emulsions to deal with. To control this, uh, for pressure, you can try to maintain pressure above onset conditions, but that's rarely possible if you want to actually produce the, the field. Uh, avoiding compatible blends, so you don't want to dump a condensate into a asphaltic oil in a separator, it will cause problems. Control carryover, we've had carryover of liquid phases, uh, asphaltic liquid phases that get into the gas system. And as soon as they hit all the LNGs and everything that are, are flying around the gas system, it causes a lot of problems in pumps and other things, uh, and compressors and other things. Um, you may want to adjust your lift gas composition if possible. If you dry these up, uh, so they're primarily methane, they'll have less tendency to uh, uh, cause uh, issues with asphaltine destabilization. Chemicals uh, are a common uh, approach inhibitors or dispersants. Uh, there has been some uh, application of coatings. Uh, we did some coating testing even when I was uh, at DBR quite a few years ago. Uh, and sometimes these work, uh, it, but it tends to be somewhat system specific. Um, for remediation, you can use solvents, usually something like a xylene. Uh, there's some green solvents as well too, but they actually don't work as well as xylene. Uh, and this may have uh, a, a chemical package of dispersants and penetrants. You can cut, pig, or jet these. Uh, and for, for formation damage, one of the things we had to do is we actually just frack past the damage area of the formation. This is very difficult to clear out the formation damage once it occurs. So the types of Analysis that we can do and have done for asphaltine is compositional data. A lot of times that compositional data is used in stability screens, and I'll explain that in just a minute. Uh, we can do phase diagrams, and we do measure asphaltine onset pressures, uh, and we will do titrations of lag oils with gases to get uh, an asphaltine onset composition. Uh, you can try to measure deposition rate, but this is even harder than it was in wax. Uh, mostly because a, a lot of this occurs at high pressure and high temperature, which is difficult to do in something like a flow loop. Um, formation impairment also is a very, very difficult measurement. Uh, and it's one that we've worked on a, a bit, and uh, I'll share some of the results of that with you as well, too. All right, so composition, which is really important uh, for evaluation of potential asphalt team problem. 30 plus for the BLE. Uh, asphaltine content is key. Uh, you're going to have to measure an asphaltine content. Uh, usually we'll use heptane precipitation uh, in order to, to measure that content. You can also use pentane, but it is important to look at how this is measured because it's not always the same technique. SAR is saturated aromatic resin. Uh, that it helps in determining this, whether the uh, oil phase itself, the maltine phase, is a good or a poor solvent for the asphaltine. And a lot of times this will be measured together. So you'll have Sarah data, saturate asphaltine resin, 
a saturated aromatic resin asphaltene. That'll come as one measurement. Um, people have done a lot on asphaltene characterization. They've looked at molecular weights, elemental analyses, and uh, solvent fractionation, where they'll actually use different solvents to get uh, solubility groups out of the asphaltene. And that has been important in understanding what asphaltenes are and what their solubility is, but it's not a set of measurements that we usually do, uh, you know, in order to assess potential problems. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about screens because I think screens are one of the things that are really horribly misinterpreted by people. There are really three types of screens. You'll have a dead oil titration screen. So what people will do, they'll use some particular precipitating solvent. So maybe uh, pentane, maybe heptane, uh, shell, we actually use hexadecane. So there are various different saturate solvents you can use. You can either do it in a continuous titration where you continuously add at some rate the precipitin in, or you could do it discrete where you uh, put the precipitin in, you shake it up, and you give it time to equilibrate, uh, which again was the way we did it at Shell, where we would uh, uh, actually let it set for quite some time to, to try to take out the kinetic effect in this measurement. So you can see here visually uh, stable, no asphaltine present, unstable asphaltine uh, has come out of solution. Sometimes it's really hard to see, like in the wax, if you have very small amounts of asphaltine coming out, so, uh, you know, again, there may be some uh, image processing uh, potential here to, to more standardize the, uh, the phase boundary, the, the actual identification of the phase boundary. So that's one type of uh, analysis. And just to also mention that the dead oil titration is used often in the modeling as well, too. It, it gives a data point relevant to the oil and the asphalt team uh, that can be used to, to help uh, constrain uh, you know, uh, thermodynamic models. Uh, there's dead oil compositional screens. So these are usually based on SARA data. There are some that use just asphalt team resin ratio. And there are probably others, but these are the ones I'm familiar with. Uh, so here you can see a uh, SARA screen that was developed at Shell uh, while I was there. And if you have saturate over aromatic ratio and asphaltene over resin ratio, you can see where it plots. And that can give you an idea of whether your fluid is stable or unstable. The colloidal stability index is uh, basically a formula that does uh, essentially the same thing that you see here. The other class of uh, screens is the PVT screen. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the DeBoer plot. And the DeBoer plot just looks at the uh, under saturation, so the reservoir pressure minus the saturation pressure versus the in situ density. The in situ density is actually related to the in situ compressibility. So this screen really looks at things from a different perspective. It doesn't look at the oil at all. It just looks at the potential loss and stability of the system. So uh, it really is looking at something very different. Now, this screen got a lot of kind of bad press, I think, uh, because oftentimes it would predict a problem where you saw no problem. That's because they weren't really looking at the asphaltine or the liquid composition at all. They were just looking at uh, the overall PVT properties. So you could have something that fell in the severe problem region that actually had no asphaltine in the system. So you really need to use these dead oil titrations and compositional screens in conjunction with the PBT screen. And so I made a little cartoon of that, and that's what comes up next. This is a solubility trace for asphaltine as a function of pressure at a given temperature. So the asphaltine solubility in live oil is I decrease the pressure, and we talked about this, will decrease until I get to the saturation pressure. So as I go down below the saturation pressure, it comes back up because I'm liberating gas from the system. So the actual remaining liquid phase is a better solvent. So the loss in stability through pressure reduction is this right here. This is related to the compressibility of the system and the gas content of the system. So how much I lose is related to that compressibility. Lighter fluids 
will have more compressibility and uh, they will lose more stability as I decrease pressure. Heavier fluids with less gas will not lose that much. The degree of undersaturation here, this pressure change here uh, from PSAP to PRES, that also impacts this. So if I were at PSAP, then there would be no solubility loss through pressure reduction. So I won't have pressure induced deposition period in the system. It just can't happen no matter what my oil looks like. Um, if I have a large uh, delta P or uh, undersaturation, then I'll get quite a bit of uh, loss and stability, particularly if the system is very compressible. So this is the PVT screen. This is what the PVT screen tells us the potential loss in solubility through uh, pressure reduction. Now, what about the other screens? The other screens give me a dead oil stability reserve. If I have a large dead oil stability reserve, either indicated by compositional data or by a direct titation, chances are that I have enough to take care of any loss in stability that I see as I decrease in pressure. So in this case, you can see I have enough stability reserve that you know I, I don't ever really have a problem with precipitation. However, if I have a low dead oil stability reserve, then I am going to have a large region of pressure where I see destabilization. And so that's where these rules of thumb come in when people do the dead oil stability reserve or the uh, the compositional data is they'll have a bunch of fields and they'll look and say, when I have this small amount of stability reserve, oftentimes I have a problem. But you still have to look at the other side. I may have a low stability reserve, but if I'm sitting in saturation pressure, I still don't have a problem. So you really need to look at these two screens together. Uh, and that probably took longer than what it needed to take, but that was it's one of my kind of pet peeves on the use of screens that people don't use them properly. So asphaltine onset, uh, we do measure that. Uh, the, the type of measurements we do that have become fairly standard in the in industry is laser scattering. It's an NIR uh, laser and direct visualization through high pressure microscopy. Uh, in the past, other methods have been tried. Acoustic uh, conductance, interestingly enough, uh, nobody, I don't think really understood why that worked, but it seemed to work. Uh, filter plugging, which is not as sensitive as the direct visualization of the laser scattering. And I'm sure there are others that uh, I have missed in this overview. Uh, so asphaltine precipitation measurements, these are fairly standard now. Um, each lab has a slightly different configuration. I pulled pictures from the DBR lab because that's where I have the pictures from. But it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. They'll look at uh, light scattering in the near infrared, uh, and also uh, usually you have a high pressure microscope for visualization. Uh, asphaltine on inset pressure is measured with isothermal depressurization, and you can measure an AOC where people will titrate with gas. Uh, this is usually done for miscible gas EOR or for um, uh, injection gas for gas lift. Uh, like wax, the AOP function is limit to kinetics and detection limit, and there's a lot of literature on this. Um, it, the asphaltines probably have a much wider range of kinetic impacts than even waxes, and so sometimes it's a very difficult uh, to get your hand on the actual real thermodynamic boundary uh, because the kinetics uh, make a huge difference. And a low asphaltine uh, fluids, uh, again, they may be unstable. And even though there's a very small amount of asphaltine, they do cause problems, and that has been seen in the field. But actually measuring the AOP for a low uh, asphaltine content fluid is very, very difficult. All right. <clears throat> so deposition measurements, this will be the last topic. There's, it's really difficult to do this. Uh, we've done some PVT cell rinses. Uh, I'll show you some shear cell data. Capillary tube plugging has been used. Um, the, the issues with the experimentally with these are it's more difficult than wax. I mean, deposition is a function of hydrodynamics, geometry, pressure, temperature, and composition, of course, just like with wax. 
Uh, asphaltine deposition occurs in live fluids at high pressure. So we can't really do this often in our laboratory experimental conditions. So we resort a lot to solvent destabilized dead oil measurements. I say they may not be representative, but uh, I think there's been a lot of work done uh, over the years that shows where we can use these uh, measurements effectively. So just to show you some live oil deposition measurements, this is from a long time ago before we had uh, a lot of the equipment we have. And um, what we would do is just equilibrate it in a stirred PVT cell, then isobarically displace the fluid through a filter. We would measure what was suspended. Uh, that's the, the stuff that was caught on the fluid, uh, on the filter, and what was deposited on things like pistons and uh, cell walls. You can see in this particular fluid, there's a lot of deposit. So this really doesn't give you much on deposition rate because the fluid mechanics in the cell is much lower shear. Uh, some of this stuff, like on the pistons and, and the lower, uh, particularly the lower piston, is settling. It's not really depositing. But it does give you a little bit of an idea of the tendency of the, the asphalt team to stick to something. And actually, some of the early coating tests, we uh, put coatings on these metal surfaces, the pistons and things in the in the uh, in the PVT cell. And we did see differences in the amount of deposit on coated and uncoated systems. All right, this is a shear cell deposition measurement. So what we have is uh, just a Kuwet, a Taylor Kuwet flow. Uh, and here we can actually control the wall shear. Uh, so what we were trying to do is look at the impact of the wall shear on deposit amount. Uh, because asphaltine is only a small amount of them actually deposit, we had to flow through this cell uh, for most systems uh, in order to get a substantial deposit building up on the wall. And this is just a series of pictures of the cell opened up after, with the same fluid opened up after a period of time. So this is early time where we get kind of this uh, absorbed layer or, or, uh, on the entire surface. And then we see kind of uh, growth of uh, larger macroscopic deposits over time as we go to longer times. And this is not really very uniform. It's not like the wax deposits. All right, so uh, the idea on, on doing this was to look at confective shear, and this is something that's really important in asphaltine deposition. You won't see a lot of asphaltine deposition at very high shear rates. These deposits are not always that competent, so uh, it depends on the asphaltine, but often uh, at very high shear rates, you won't have a problem, and you start getting a problem as you drop down to lower shear rates. And this just shows some inhibitor testing, and in this case, uh, the inhibitor that we tested uh, was effective, but kind of like wax, it doesn't completely eliminate the deposit, but it reduces it uh, quite substantially. All right, so finally, just a couple words about near wellbore impairment. Uh, this is a real problem. Uh, if the pressure in the reservoir is above the onset pressure and during in the area near the well where we draw it down, it falls below the onset pressure, we get an accumulation or it can possibly get an accumulation of asphaltines in the near wellbore region, it's similar to condensate banking. I keep bringing in fresh fluid and it keeps dropping its asphaltine in this area. It's really difficult to measure this in the lab because this is all high temperature, high pressure. Uh, and there are some issues with, uh, if you're doing core floods or slim tube, you do need to actually hit the asphaltine onset in the porous media because it will make a difference. Uh, if you hit it outside of the porous media, you tend to just filter the stuff off at the face of the porous media you're injecting into. So we have done some core floods. There's a nice slim tube experiment that it uh, was done. Uh, potentially, uh, maybe some microfluidic measurements can also help us better understand this process. So this is just showing the core flood apparatus. It's pretty common. Uh, what we would use is uh, composite cores, which is a problem in itself, but uh, that was all we had. And so you'd get these uh, stack cores, you'd measure pressure along the length of the core, and you would look over time uh, how the asphaltine built up and impacted the permeability. Uh, and the trick, again, like I said, was I have to be above the asphaltine onset when I go into the core, and somewhere in the core, I have to fall down below that onset pressure. Uh, this was a, a set of experiments that actually worked pretty well. 
it was done on a, a fluid from Lake Maracaibo, Venezuela, where we knew that the wells actually did have impairment, and we could see the impairment uh, in the core flood. So, uh, in areas where we had low permeability and we were, you know, into the area where we were getting precipitation, the pressure region where we were getting precipitation, and these would be areas like section two and section four, we saw a large decrease in uh, the permeability. In areas of where we had high permeability, uh, the permeability was not decreased as much, and that was kind of what we expected. Uh, one last uh, thing that I really have to put in for asphalt teens, and we discussed a little bit before about it, about storing samples, is that it's really key that you get a good sample to do these measurements because it can be expensive. Uh, and if you get a bad sample of data, it's really not worth that much. So if you're doing live oil uh, measurements for asphalt teens, make sure the asphalt teen is sampled above the onset pressure. Uh, so you're going to be one. Uh, Keep it close to the reservoir pressure with minimal drawdown. Uh, you want to use pressure compensated bottles. We wish we had pressure and temperature compensated bottles, but th there's no such thing right now. So this is better than, than nothing. Um, you want to take multiple samples from the zone because you need to do some QC checks. Uh, equilibrate it at T res and P above reservoir pressure. Um, equilibration time again. Some are fast, some are slow. Uh, standard, I think, is, is maybe about five days or so. Uh, you, we want to minimize the contamination. Uh, that being said, a lot of the new uh, versions of formation testers are actually doing much, much better with contamination. So oftentimes we can get this. Uh, and I, like I mentioned before, do not store samples for extended periods of time. The temperature falls during the storage. You can be precipitating asphaltines. And these actually can form a sludge in your, your sample cylinder that makes it very, very difficult to re-equilibrate. Some equilibrate are okay, some don't. And that's where you would need to take like samples and look at asphaltine content of the fluid before you would uh, actually do any measurements. And these are just a couple of case examples that are really quite old actually. One shows that as I add this particular OPM, that I actually am increasing the asphalt team stability, and eventually I will get to the point where I don't see any onset, even though the original fluid had onset. Uh, the other one on this side just shows that if I had it, this MPSR, which uh, uh, actually does not have pressure compensation, but I have kept my fluid intact and I was able to re-equilibrate it, I got a decent measurement for asphaltine onset. The SPMC is pressure compensated chamber, and I got a decent measurement. This MRSC could not be equilibrated on site uh, at reservoir conditions. And so from it, set samples were transferred into a, a sample bottle for transfer to the lab. And I did lose a lot of asphaltines in that MRSC. So uh, it's just something to be aware of. And so with that, I am done with the presentation. Hopefully I haven't gone too long and uh, I would be open to uh, questions. Very good, very good. So uh, we have a lot of uh, questions, uh, uh, John, so I'll just try my best to go through them uh, fairly, uh, fairly systematically. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'll just uh, go from the top and, and, uh, and down them, uh, John. There was a few of the questions that actually was kind of answered in the presentation as well, but I think uh, we can go through them anyway, so we just have everybody on the same uh, page. So, so the first one is that based on a wide range of experience um, that you have, John, uh, has anyone experienced significant wax and gas condensate production? Uh, so I mentioned gas condensate as opposed to oil slash heavy oil. There was actually a few people also in the Q&A session that, that answered that, that in their fields, they have experience with that, but just uh, a couple of sentences. <clears throat> yeah, gas condensates are really interesting. I didn't have time to put it in here, but uh, I uh, maybe next time I will. Gas condensates are really interesting. There are some very, very waxy gas condensates. So, yes, you can have uh, wax problems in wells and in flow lines uh, for gas condensates. One of the interesting things, though, about gas condensates, and I saw this actually, it was an offshore field that uh, we were, as Shell, going to produce into an existing uh, system, a gathering system, but it, this particular condensate had a really high wax appearance temperature. It was like at 
over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the gas company who managed the lines did not really want to bring that in. But we were really near the saturation pressure in the reservoir. So we were going to, within months, fall below the saturation pressure. And we would start leaving condensate in the reservoir because this was relatively lean. It wasn't a, a rich gas condensate. What happens is the stuff that stays in the reservoir is heavy. Your, your wax appearance temperature like drops like a rock uh, on the produced fluids after it starts, uh, you know, the, the condensate starts coming out in the reservoir. And so what we told these guys is we said, we're gonna produce it, but we've done the reservoir modeling and the wax modeling. And we think within like three to four months, it's gonna come down from over a hundred to less than 60. And so, you know, they were a little bit incredulous about that, but it did, it actually did from our modeling. So that's one thing to realize with the gas condensates is that it, it, it's a lean gas condensate precipitating in the reservoir. You will see your wax appearance temperature change hugely. But to answer the question, yeah, I mean, there's gas condensates can oftentimes be very waxy. Very good. And uh, while we are at, uh, or in the realm of uh, gas concepts, I guess, we also have a question on the asphaltine side that we have detected asphaltines present in liquids condensed, uh, condensed from uh, gas. That is also in the gas phase at reservoir conditions. How asphaltines, ex how, or how does asphaltines exist in equilibrium with the gas at reservoir conditions? No liquid pr uh, phase present. Uh, it depends on how you define your gas phase. I mean, I, there are some condensates in the Gulf of Mexico that are essentially black oils that exhibit a dew point. Uh, and in that situation, you've added a lot of biogenic gas to the system to where you flip the phase behavior over. So your, your, your gas phase in a reservoir is actually, you know, more of a near critical, uh, very dense phase. So at high temperatures, high pressures with a lot of gas in it, you can envision a situation where the gas phase in the reservoir is dense enough to, that the asphaltines have some solubility in, in, that, uh, in that phase. So you can have it, it's probably not as common. I mean, you're, you're typically thermally generated gas condensates. You're not really gonna see it, uh, but in, systems that are hybrids where you're, or even in near critical systems where you're actually, that single phase is actually quite dense. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you can have asphaltine solubilized in that phase. And then uh, while we're at that, uh, so if we go a little bit into uh, uh, lighter oils, uh, I guess the, the question there is, does the risk of asphaltine precipitation or deposition increase when the wax is present? When wax is present? No. Um, some people have said that uh, the wax uh, that has come out of solutions can act as nucleating sites for the asphaltine precipitation. And we do see that a little bit. I mean, the, the nice picture I showed you was one of the few pictures where we actually saw wax and asphaltine together. Uh, a lot of times the asphaltine kind of coats the wax crystals. So maybe there's a synergistic effect there. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say, uh, but typically the driving forces for precipitation, I mean, they're, they're kind of separate. I mean, you can have systems where they co-precipitate, but I, I, I'm not sure how, uh, you know, how much they work together. Yeah. I think, uh, Curtis, you have a question. Yeah, I just, uh, John, this Curtis, uh, that previous question about um, asphaltines in, in gas condensates or reservoir fluids that have a dew point. I mean, what if we had just a conventional saturated gas cap oil system where the oil is asphaltenic, it's precipitating or, or the, the asphaltine components, do they partition into the gas cap through the normal equilibrium? No, I don't think you'd see, I don't think you would see much. It would have to be, it would have to be a very high pressure uh, and you would have to have a very dense gas. I mean, right. that we, we have that, this, this issue came up on the Mars platform and it ended up being carryover. But what people were saying is, you know, because the facilities guy said, we have no carryover. Okay. So the asphaltine must be vaporize in the gas phase, which is really hard to envision because they're such large 
polar molecules. I mean, you'd have to be really high temperature and then they'd probably degrade. Uh, so in the end, we figured out that it was carryover of a small amount of asphaltic liquid. So if you have a system where you're saturated in the reservoir and you don't have huge compositional gradients where you go, you know, uh, are changing all over the map, um, you wouldn't expect to see any asphaltine issues because you're saturated. There's, it, it, there's no loss in solubility due to depressurization. And the gas is, I mean, the gas isn't going to have any substantial asphaltine. It's way too low pressure. So you wouldn't see it. However, if you have a low stability reserve, you do your titration, you have a low stability reserve on your oil, you need to be really careful with the oil when you're producing it that you don't mix it with incompatible fluids. Right. So even the, the asphaltic oil can still be a problem, but you're not getting it pressure induced. It's usually something else. So, so in, in people that are doing compositional grading calculations that include asphaltine compounds, I, I think very little of that's out there, but I think Shell did that back in the eighties in the beer field. Do they actually see the asphaltine components kind of like disappearing far enough uh, up into the up structure as you uh, go from oil to gas? They basically, they just don't partition. <laughs> Well, if you, or, or, if you have a continuous phase transition, you'll see the, uh, I mean, the asphaltine composition will be continuous as well, too. And it will, you know, drop down to very, very low values high up in the reservoir, and it will be much higher, uh, lower in the reservoir. If you have a phase transition, like a saturation pressure, and that's what your compositional uh, variation looks like, you will, I mean, you can calculate it because it, you know, from the thermodynamics, I can calculate how much asphaltine would be in the, the vapor phase, but it's negligible because that, that density is so low and there's nothing in there to solubilize it. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Um, the, uh, could you comment on the impact of gravity uh, when it comes to the accumulation of deposited uh, waxes, particularly in, in risers as wax components are high molecular weight compounds? Yeah, well, the wax is going to be denser than the, uh, uh, you know, it's going to be denser than the surrounding fluid. So you can get gravity segregation. Uh, if you have very high flow rates, the, the wax will be, you know, uh, fluidized and move up with your flow stream. But if it's low, then you have to kind of look at the, you know, the difference between kind of that viscous force moving it up. Uh, and the gravitational force move it down. I could see if you have a low flow rate, it would tend to settle. Uh, uh, as per your presentation, wax are mostly mostly normal paraffins. Asphaltines are mostly aromatic in nature. Uh, let's say you have, um, let's say at reservoir conditions, you have both asphaltines and waxes mm -hmm. in both solution. So if you inject an uh, oxygen into the reservoir, uh, so air, uh, uh, could part of the wax uh, wax fraction turn into an asphaltine fraction due to oxidation reactions? I don't think so. Um, you know, asphaltines tend to be aromatic and have uh, a lot of heteros in that. And I don't think you, well, I mean, you could be adding an oxygen, but it'd be more of a burning. So uh, you'd be probably seeing more CO2 and not oxygen functional groups like phenols and, and things like that. So I think you know, you're probably not moving waxes to asphaltines, but you may be dropping some uh, carbon, which yes. is not going to be very soluble, more, you know, graphite carbon type stuff, uh, which I wouldn't strictly call an asphaltine because it's a little bit different. Well, we're at the gas injection. Um, uh, there's a question. Could you provide some general guidance on what a target injection gas compensation would be for a reservoir fluid prone to asphaltine precipitation or is there any? Yeah, I can tell you what to avoid. I mean, um, CO2 does destabilize uh, and you can you know, do some titration experiments to see how, how bad that is in your particular reservoir. Where the problem occurs is not so much in the reservoir, even though likely you are depositing some asphaltine in the reservoir. It's just not a lot. I mean, a lot of the asphaltine contents are still only in the single digit percentages, and they don't cause a lot of permeability damage in the bulk of the reservoir. Where you get the main problems is when the gas breaks through to the producers, 
And so you get injection gas mixing with, you know, fluid that has not contacted the injection gas yet at higher pressures in the, in the producer wells, and that causes a problem. If I'm looking at uh, gas injection for hydrocarbon gases, it's really, it's a trade-off. I mean, uh, you know, things that probably are going to cause you problems are things that uh, are saturated and strongly partitioned into the oil phase. And so that would be your light gas components like C2, C3, C4. Um, and those are what typically cause the problems in uh, lift gas. Uh, but that depends on the pressure. Uh, that you're injecting it at. Um, the problem is, is, if I try to lighten that up, then my MMP goes up or my MME goes way up. So you have that kind of uh, trade off that uh, a lot of the gases that are good from the MMP, MME standpoint uh, are destabilizing. So something you just have to keep an eye on. But where you really need to look at that is, is when, the, when it breaks through, when your gas breaks through to the producer. That's when we see most of the problems. Excellent. We'll take one last question. There's so many questions here that I get also in the private chat. So uh, we'll just have to, uh, um, all our emails are on witson.com uh, slash people. So if you want to uh, reach out uh, after the fact, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer some uh, uh, detailed questions then as well. But at least the last question is, uh, Sarah measurements take time and are relatively tedious and expensive. Yeah. The second option is to use uh, Lateral scan. I wonder if you have experience using that kind of equipment and what your opinion is on the quality slash reliability of those results. Yeah, we, we, we did try to use after scan um, <clears throat> at Shell and we, we fell back to uh, uh, Sarah, but uh, because we, we had a, a lot of, what do I want to say, disconnect between what our Sarah was telling us. Uh, what I after scan was telling us for asphalting content or resins. Um, the problem is, is if you standardize on a certain set of measurements, uh, I think you're okay. Uh, but all our correlations were more geared towards the standard SARA, and particularly the SARA done by a specific technique. Uh, so a lot of the correlations and everything like that would have had to have been completely refit. Uh, using the IAPTA scan data, so we didn't go that way. Um, but there are, you know, different ways of measuring this. I've seen like uh, HPLC measurements where they come up with a SARA. Uh, it, it, uh, it, at Schlumberger, we actually developed a microfluidic uh, method for measuring SARA, which was reasonably consistent and reproducible. Um, so, but the thing to watch with the SARA is the procedures between the labs can differ a lot. Uh, and those differences in procedure will cause a difference in the SARA results you get. So my recommendation would be to choose one you're comfortable with and stick with it uh, for all your modeling. And what will happen is your correlations adjust uh, to the SARA data that you're getting. Because really the way we split these up it's, it's not like there's one right answer. Uh, they all tell us a similar thing, but the fractions are slightly different depending on the procedure. Very good. So uh, on that note, we'd like to thank uh, everyone for uh, coming uh, today. Also not to mention thank uh, you, John, for uh, the generosity and spending the time with us the last uh, hour and 20 uh, minutes. Um, again, the recordings and the presentation will be sent out to all the participants and also will be posted on our LinkedIn uh, page and uh, YouTube channel. So on that note, uh, everybody, have a good uh, evening or a good rest of the uh, day. Thanks much, John. Mm -hmm.